Praise the Lord, everybody. Welcome to Temporal Church International Faith University. I am Minister Claudette Taylor, and I will be teaching your Sunday school lesson today. And it is on the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Yes. <laughs> and it's coming from Luke 23, 33 through 49. But before we get started, let's pray. Lord God, I thank you for this day as I thank you for every day, Father God. I thank you for my pastors that they did not have, find it robbery, Lord God, to allow me to teach this lesson today. So I ask you, Father, to move Claudette out of the way and let your excellence take his rightful place, Lord God, that I may be able to teach this lesson where those that are listening, Lord God, will either be reminded of your goodness and your grace and which you paid on the cross for us, Lord God or give them new knowledge and new understanding. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen, and amen. Now, I like to give you a fun fact. So my fun fact for today is on Easter. So I want you to read my t-shirt. It says, silly rabbit, Easter is for Jesus. That is from the pit of hell. <laughs> Yes, sir. We, Easter has nothing to do with the resurrection of Jesus. In fact, it is a pagan holiday from the um, goddess of fertility named Eostre, which is E-O-S-T-R-E. -E. And sometimes you'll find it, find it spelled E-A-S-T-R-E. -E. And that is where you get your Easter bunnies, your chicks, and your eggs, and your colors, your lavender pinks and yellows, because the goddess was celebrated at the beginning of spring. So, yes, ma'am, yes, sir, we do not celebrate Easter. We celebrate the resurrection of Christ. So if you didn't know, now you know. <laughs> and that is my fun fact for today. Amen. So let's get in the word. So again, I'm going to be teaching on the crucifixion. However, that event was described in the four gospels in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So what I wanted to do was take from each one of them um, some points rather than just focusing on Luke. So I'm going to start by giving you a prelude as the lesson kind of jumps into the crucifixion. I want to give you a prelude up into the crucifixion. So I'm going to read Luke 22, 66 through 71, and then I'll begin to paraphrase. Amen. So let's get started. So Luke twenty two sixty six says, And as soon as it was day, the elders of the people and the chief priests and the scribes came together and led him, Jesus, into their council, saying, Art thou the Christ? Tell us. And he said unto them, If I tell you, you will not believe. And if I also ask you, you will not answer me, nor will you let me go. Hereafter shall the Son of Man sit on the right hand of the power of God. Then said they all, Are thou the Son of God? And he said unto them, Ye say that I am. <laughs> and they said, What? need we any further witness for we ourselves have heard of his own mouth amen so now when i was reading this i used to work in the court for 30 some years so i automatically my mind went to the place of the court and this part we would call that today a pre-trial and a pre-trial is when all the parties of a case get together to find out the facts of the case to see if we have everything we need to go to trial. 
And here, that is what happened. The priest went to the chief priest, took Jesus to the chief priest and the council, the elders and the scribes, and they came together and asked him these questions about who he was. And they finally determined by his statement, uh, ye say that I am. He said it with his own mouth. So yes, he's guilty. So now we're going to take him to the next level, which is the trial before Pilate. Pilate is the Roman governor of Judea. And he's equal um, to what a judge would be here and now. So he has that same type of authority. He can either punish Jesus or he can release him. So now they're at Pilate. Um, they've come to Pilate at the what they call the um, Hall of Common. And they're telling Pilate that he has committed this crime, that a crime of blasphemy, that he thinks that he is at the same level as God and he has to be punished. And Pilate says, no, you're at the wrong place. This is not a crime. This is a religious offense. So you all should, you know, deal with this. This is not my jurisdiction. This is your jurisdiction. He's doing something against your laws. And so they say, no, but we cannot put him to death. They wanted him crucified. So they tell him, you have the authority to put him to death. We don't. So that's why we're coming to you, Pilate. And so now Pilate goes back into what I say is the courtroom. And he begins to ask Jesus the same exact questions. He wants to know, are you the king of Jews? And Jesus gives him the same answer. If you say I am. And now Pilate goes back to them and still says, I, I still don't find anything. I, I, I don't find anything wrong here. He hasn't committed a crime. And so, you know, the chief pre priest being what I call the prosecuting attorney, he has to now change his charge because the charge that they previously gave Jesus, Pilate did not accept. So now the chief priest is saying, no, 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 no. He did commit a crime that you can manage. He committed a crime, a political crime against Rome. So he's been stirring up the people from Galilee to this place. And, you know, Pilate at this point, he's like, ding, ding, ding. Did you say Galilee? So this now becomes a political thing because now Pilate is saying, Mm, Galilee, this this is not my jurisdiction. You you need to turn him over to Herod. Uh, you know, I'm going to contact Herod because that's his jurisdiction. <laughs> He's the ruler of Galilee. So let's take Jesus on over to Herod. And Herod, of course, is excited to see that he's going to have Jesus because he's only heard about the miracles and signs and wonders that Jesus has performed along the way, but he has not seen it face to face. So now he's excited to be in his presence to see this wonderful man of God. But when he gets him, of course, they mock him. They treat him bad just as the other people did. And they're asking the same questions. And what does Jesus do? He did nothing. <laughs> he didn't even entertain them. So now Herod is like, you know, I don't see nothing. Take him back to Pilate. So he returns him back to Pilate. And the scripture says that, you know, in this um, transformation, that Pilate and Herod end up becoming friends. And before that, they were what I call their frenemies instead of friends because they were at odds. They did not have a relationship. But after this, they began a relationship because isn't it funny that two people that has nothing to do with each other, don't want to have anything to do together, um, come together, but they will come together just to take you down. Amen. <laughs> and that's what Herod and Pilate did with Jesus, but it did not work because Herod brought him right back. And when he brought him back, he's now telling him, 
telling the chief priests and the multitude and the people and the council that, look, I've already examined him. Why, you know, not even Herod has found anything wrong with him. So what do you want me to do? Like, he has not done anything wrong. But here I go. I have somebody for you, somebody who has committed murder, somebody who has done something wrong. We can punish that person. His name is um, Barbaraeus. We will punish him. I can give you him and let Jesus go. And those people, they lost their minds. They started yelling, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. They wanted him crucified. And now they're starting to riot. And Pilate is panicking, right? So he thinks during the Passover season, he has the authority to do what our president does. And that is pardon someone a crime, a, a criminal, if he wants to. So he was thinking he could pardon Jesus during the Passover season and give them still this other murderer, this other criminal. And when he put that before them, of course, they weren't having it. They were like, no, 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 no. You, you let him go and you give us Jesus. And he's like, what has this man done? What evil has this man done that you all want him punished so much? I, I can't find it. And he's still trying to, you know, figure out how to fix this thing. Because again, remember, it's about politics at this point. You know, he's like, are y'all going to tear up my city or I'm going to give up this man? So now Pilate is in a bad place because even his plan B did not work, that he would be able to pardon him. So now he's offering up a plan C. He says, okay, well, what if I just chastise him? Now, in Luke, it says chastise. And of course, that means to punish him. And when you look it up, it goes a little bit further to punish by whipping. Um, so I took it from actual Mark, which says, Mark 15 and 15 said, Pilate, willing to content the people, release Barabbas, um, I'm going to mess his name up, I'm sorry, Barabbas unto them and delivered Jesus when he has scourged him to be crucified. So the word scourge is a lot harder and harsher than chastise, right? <laughs> that sounds a little, oh, you're just going to get a little punishment, get a little talking to. No, 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 no. He scourged him. And what does that mean? It means that he whipped him. And what they did was they took strips of leather and tied them together and placed metal pieces and things on it. So when they, when they went to whip Jesus, they would snatch his skin and tissues from his body. So if you can imagine, you know, during slavery when they were having whip, they were being whipped and they had whips on their backs. Can you imagine that they are doing that and now ksh, his skin and tissues is coming off that thing? And guess what? Here's the thing. The Romans were known for when they punished a criminal, they whipped him 40 times. So he took 40 stripes just for you, not just a whip, but 40 stripes of them taking his tissues and body a skin off of him. Imagine that, that now the pouring of the blood is coming out of him. Amen. And so now that they will move on after they scourged him, Pilate, that, he thought that that was going to make the people change their mind because it was so horrendous that he thought seeing that, that they would change their mind and say, you know, enough. He, he don't need to die. That, that was more than enough, what you just did. But that wasn't for them. They still were yelling, crucify him, crucify him. And to stop in a, um, them from taking over an insurrection and taking over the city, he conceded 
and turned them over to his soldiers. And now his soldiers are, again, he's being mocked and spit on and hit on. And now his soldiers rip his clothes off of him and they place a purple robe upon him. And this is my purple robe. <laughs> They place a purple robe around him and then they put a crown of thorns. Yes, Lord. On his head. And then they gave him what's called a reed so that he would have the look of a king only so that they can mock him again. And they go, hail, hail, hail the king of Jews, kneeling down, hailing to him while they're spitting on him. And then they took the reed and smacked him on the top of his head. Now, what do you, you know, I did it kind of lightly because uh, this crown is very serious. <laughs> but they smacked it on top of his head, right? And what do you think? I'm going to show you a little bit closer. My crown. Do you see the thorns? What do you think these thorns win when they smack them on top of his head? It, and now the blood is pouring from his head and his back. Once they finished taunting him, that's what I'm going to call it, they placed his clothes, they took those things off of him and placed his clothes back on him. And now they're preparing him to be crucified. And on their way to the crucifixion place, they saw a man named Simon who was of African descent from, um, I don't have it before me. I want to say it was, um, I'm not even going to guess it. I can see it in my head, but I didn't write it down. So I apologize to you. Um, but it was from, he was from Africa, the, the Northern part of Africa. And because of that, they felt that he had to have been a black toned man, right? Because he was African. And so much so that, Early on, when Hollywood depicted um, this story, they actually used Sidney Poitier, who was one of the first black actors in the role as the person who carried the cross for Jesus. So Simon was compelled to bear the cross for Jesus because Jesus just could not do it. They were beating him and on the way to be crucified and they finally get to Calvary. Now you may see um, Calvary as um, the term skull or the place of skulls because Calvary was actually outside of the city of Jerusalem. They were outside um, of the city walls and it was the place where they took the people to crucify them and kill them, right? So that is why it was called a place of skulls. And now they're there to do the actual crucifixion. Now the crucifixion just means that he's been nailed to the cross. And if I had a cross, I, if I could have put some sticks together, <laughs> I would have did that too. You know, they spread his arms wide and they put the nails in his hands and in his feet. And that is what the crucifixion actually was, that part of it, right? But here's the thing. In my studies, I found that um, people who researched this and theologians question whether it was the nails were in his hands. They said that, you know, then Romans, they like to... For the people to be in super pain. So they put nails in their wrists and in their ankles, not their hands and their feet. But I had to, you know, I have to say you can't believe everything you read. Amen. Because if you go back to the story of the Dolly Thomas story, <laughs> if you go back to the Donna Thomas story, Thomas wasn't there. He didn't believe it. And so he wanted to see it for himself. And Jesus came before him and said, here my hands. <laughs> Scriptures say, Jesus says, here are my hands. Feel the nails, Thomas. Here they are. Feel it. 
not my risk. <laughs> so you don't believe everything you read. I know they have, you know, um, they're scholars and all that, but you got to read some things for yourself because scripture tells us that they did not put it in his wrist, in his hands. Amen. So now he is on the cross and they're still mocking him like this is never enough for these people the same wonderful people you know as palm sunday so that i say the same wonderful people who were throwing them palms and hosanna hosanna he is going to be our messiah woo, woo, come on jesus come on throw on your little donkey now they throwing stones now they're telling him, mocking him, telling him, if you are the king of, uh, of the Jews, then get yourself down. And even the chief priest talking about, you know, well, if you can save others, then save yourselves. And now there are two thieves that were also being crucified alongside Jesus, one on the right and one on the left. I'm going to call them thief A and thief B. <laughs> A long time ago, I did a study on this, and I always say Thief A decided to chime in on the mocking, right? I call him a hop on because he heard everybody else and what they were saying and what the chief priest said. And so he decides to tell Jesus the same thing, but he added something to it. He says, uh, yeah, Jesus, if you won't get yourself down, Take me down too. He said, take us down too. Because he was just trying to get the hookup, right? <laughs> he didn't care nothing about what was going on. He was just like, look, if you got that kind of power that you can get off this cross, take me down there too. But then the B is saying, nah, bruh, mm -mm. he did nothing wrong. But we, we did what they accused us of. And we should be punished. For what they accused us of. He shouldn't be punished for anything. He didn't do anything wrong. In fact, you should honor this man. And at that time, I always feel like, and this isn't scripture, but this is what I felt, that Thief B, he was repenting before God. He was telling Jesus, I believe who you are, and I am sorry for what I did, and I am willing to take, pay the price and pay take the consequences of my actions. But if you are who you say you are, then let me join you. Take me with you. And Jesus would say to him, it says in Luke 23, 43, and Jesus said unto him, verily I say unto thee, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Now, our wonderful theologians again, <laughs> In my studies, they would argue that when he says today, it should be a comma there because it needs to be defined whether Jesus is talking about he's going to take the B with him when he gives up the ghost in that moment today or eventually. And I'm here to tell you, if I'm Thief B, I don't care about no karma. I don't care if Jesus say he going to take me the moment he gave up the ghost or if he going to come back and get me. Whatever I know is that I'm going to heaven. <laughs> so nobody cares about no karma behind today, theologians. Because <laughs> I'm telling you, if God has to take me, I don't care if it's right now or eventually, long as I know I'm going to heaven. Amen? Amen. <laughs> so now the time has come. The, we're in the sixth hour, and now darkness is starting to fill the earth because we are filling it now. And I actually wanted to read this part, so I'm going to um, go to it so that we can... You can actually hear what actually took place. So I'm reading um, Luke 44 and it says, and it was about the sixth hour and there was a darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. And the sun was darkened and the veil of the temple was rent in the mist. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, un into thy hands I commend thee. 
I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. Now, in the other scriptures, in the other, um, in Matthew or Mark, it actually says, before he gives up the ghost, he says, my God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? He gives out a loud cry. And they mistaken it for him saying El Elias. And then it was like, you know, don't, and you know, don't, don't worry about that. Give him some vinegar to drink. And then we're going to see if he comes to save him before he gave up the ghost. But then he took a loud voice again uh, and gave up the ghost. And now these people, <laughs> they were not satisfied, but I'm going to, um, keep reading and the other scriptures, it tells you that they would come through to see the people that the criminals on the cross to make sure that they were dead. They would break their bones or pierce them. And when they got to Jesus, they saw that he had already given up the ghost. So they did not break his bones, but they pierced him in his side and water and blood flew, came out. And now, also, I believe it's in um, Matthew 27. It speaks of the earth. When Jesus gave up the ghost, there was a great earthquake that took place. So those were the things that I did want to make sure I captured because it's not here in Luke. So I'm going to finish reading 47. It says, now when the centurion saw what was done, he glorified God saying, certainly this was a righteous man and all the people that came together to, the, to thy sight, beholding the things which were done, smut their breasts and returned. And all his acquaintance and the women that followed him from Galilee stood afar off beholding these things. And I just want to say, I, I hope I gave you a good picture of what um, Jesus went through just for me, just for you, just for us, so that we can be saved from our sins, that he bore the 40 stripes, that he poured the blood, and he carried the crown of thorn, thorns just for for us and John 3 16 says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not shall not perish but have eternal life and then you go down to John um, 15 13 and it says greater love have no man than this that a man laid down his life for a friend or for his friends and I'm telling you that is one of my favorite songs I, I wish I could sing <laughs> but I'm not an admin the 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 the, the admin family can blow but I my favorite song is I am a friend of God so I hope today that you can say that you are a friend of God because he bore it all for you he paid the cost all for you so you can be a friend. Amen. So I'm going to pray us out. Lord God, I thank you for this word today. I thank you for shedding your blood just for us, Lord God, that we may be saved, Lord God. So I hope that we take this time, Lord God, of reflection of what you paid, the cost you paid, the blood you shed, Lord God, the pain you took on, my God, just for us, Lord God, that we don't take that pain and that blood for for um, we don't take it for granted, Lord God. You're suffering for granted, Father God. But we take it and we run with it. And so that somebody else may be saved, Lord God. So I pray that if it's anybody who is listening today, Lord God, touch them. Give us the words to say to reach them and teach them, Lord God, of who you are and whose we are. In the name of Jesus, thank you, Lord. And I claim victory over all things in Jesus' name. So thank you, thank you, thank you. I truly enjoyed this lesson today, and I hope you did too. And I ask you to join us again next Sunday at the same time and the same place. Amen.